So remember last season when I said we were stepping things up? You are not ready for the progress I am about to show you for this season. Oh, and we smashed our transfer record not once, but twice. At least in this intro, I was able to remember how to count. We have not one, not two, but two. <laughs> Despite our drop in player values, our transfer budgets are bigger than ever. And we actually now have the freedom to go and spend a big chunk of it, which is exactly what we're doing right now over on stream. So join us over there after you've caught up on season 10 over here. Do I even need to tell you that the VODs are on the second channel and that it's linked in the description? I mean, I have anyway, but there you go. Normal service has now resumed on the channel. You should have hopefully now seen the forced youth academy challenge video. I've also got an agent video, a world cup video in the works as well, as well as uh, a video where we make pensioners come through at youth academies. Perhaps normal is the wrong word. So we came into season 10 of Building a Nation with Sirens of Malta with one very clear goal, and it wasn't even really about us. It was to get another Maltese team to finally be able to help us out in Europe and qualify for some kind of group stage. In the meantime, of course, we wanted to make sure that we replicated our form of last season and hopefully get out of the Champions League group for the second year in a row. As you can tell from the title, it's been a year of heavy spending, and much like last year, there's been very few you out at all. But there has still been one that I want to quickly highlight for you. And this is he, Leonardo Teixeira. He was the centre-back that we signed from Nationale a couple of seasons ago. In fact, it was two seasons ago for, I think, actually around £2 million as it goes. We've now moved him on to Benfica for £2 million. Now, bear in mind, £2 million for one of our players now is like top draw money. How could you turn that down? But at best, we were going to break even on this deal. Now, actually, that's not truthfully the case because we have managed to insert a 50% of next sale fee in there. So either Benfica sell him to someone and we get some money or they'll offer to buy that clause off of us. Now, I don't know the exact amount that they'd want for him right now. And honestly, I think if I asked, it won't even actually tell us. Uh, actually, you can see 6.6 .6 to 7.8 million pounds. So around about seven, which makes me think that they might actually potentially buy that clause off of us for a further three million pounds at some point, potentially, maybe a little bit less. As for ins, we've honestly gone a little bit crazy this year. I believe we've spent close to 18 million pounds on new signings over the course of this window. And a lot of them are first team players as well. And you might think, but haven't the values dropped by 95%? And yeah, they have. But at least now we know exactly where we stand financially. So now I'm actually more willing to spend money because I know exactly where we're at with it rather than waiting for the hammer to drop and destroy all of our values. In theory, the only way is up from here. So we've kind of invested in the future. The first player to join us was, of course, Jose Padilla for £350,000 from Cantalau. He, for me, might potentially be a future... I think this is a, a bold statement, I realise, but looking how good he is right now, I think we win the Champions League with him starting up front for us one day uh, as that Trek Ortista. Now, right now, you can see that he's actually played 16 games for us this year as well. Eight goals, two assists, which is not bad for a guy who's still sort of learning the role, getting used to the team. Next signing was a really weird one. This is Rob Hilton. Uh, we signed him on a free transfer from Manchester City as he was released, but the main reason we liked him is because we play a libero in the middle of our back line with the back five, and Man is basically that. He's got 14 passing, 14 vision, solid as a centre-back all round. So he just felt like the perfect option for us there to bring in good on both feet. Uh, I love the fact that he's got monster at second nationality. Did cost us £8,500 a week, but we've got a big enough wage budget now that this is actually a first-team signing for us. We can drop £10,000 a week on them now and feel pretty comfortable. And you can see that he has played 28 games. He played a lot more towards the start of the season, but then other players just seem to sort of usurp him in the team. And I'm actually starting to wonder if he might be the type of guy that we could maybe even flip because I don't know how much of a future he actually he has. That may change when I show you an absolutely insane tactic we've been working on, though. The last of the signings that actually joined us technically at the back end of last season, but it still counts as this year, was, at the time, our record signing, Vladimir Steva, who comes in for £3 million from Rijeka in Croatia. And upon saying that, I've just realised that we actually broke our transfer record three times. So, apparently, indeed, I was right. I cannot count. Point being, we decided to drop £3 million on him because he had the pace, he had some solid tent poles, which, when I say tent poles, I'm referring to, like, the things that hold up the circus tent, or the tent that keeps it going. Dribbling, finishing first touch for me and composure on strike is what I really, really like, along with pace and acceleration. Needless to say, he's got those. And the best part about it as well is that Birke Kara will actually, we didn't even have to do anything. They came in and said, we'd love him on loan. And I said, have at it, lads. And I believe he's had an injury at one point, but still 11 goals for them this year. At one point, he had like 11 in 10. So he has really sort of dropped off in the second half of the year. I wonder if it's because of that injury. But needless to say, I really, really like him. And I think giving them a guy like this for a few seasons could really help a team like Bikki He could maybe, probably not be the Harris Zivkovic of this save, but he has that kind of mold. Then we have this chap here, Nicolas Del Castillo, 240k from America de Cali in Colombia. 21 year old. Ignore the stars for a second and just look at the attributes that he has. And now he actually can 
the head of football, which is always a bonus for a centre-back. We just really liked him on a pure attributal basis. And he feels like one of these players that is just going to overperform. And this is sort of irrelevant to him, frankly. He just looks like a good option. And you know what? 19 starts for us, just the one goal. I've been really pleased with his output for us frankly, this season. So it's just nice to have that depth. And again, he is on £11,000 a week as well. Another player I'm very excited about is Salim Kadri. Uh, and he is now an Algerian international. And he was free from Academy JMG Paradu. I mean, free. You can't really get much better than a player like this for free. Now, we've got him on his aerial training, obviously. Still has the five-star potential, allegedly. He has now picked up two Algeria caps to who's he wanted by? Benfica. That's always a good sign as well. Driven personality. He can jump. He's not the quickest, but he's got okay acceleration. Really solid mentals as well. I think he could be a future centre-back star for us. Uh, we have technically got him listed for loan, but no one's actually come in for him. And I feel like he's actually played a lot more towards the end of the season and might start to creep into it a lot more next year anyway. But for me, he might be one of the best signings we've made this season. Another one we're super stoked about is this chap here. And there's many reasons for this. This is Hassan al Uh Main reason, I like an interesting nationality. We saw a Libyan guy. Now, often when you see, you do sometimes get a lot of Libyan players that when they first come through your scout reports because you tend not to have great scouting knowledge of Libya will be rated quite high and then when you scout them further the potential level drops we just assumed he was going to be another one of those and he came in and had the five stars and is still on five stars right now which is really exciting to see and the best part as well he's gone out on loan we have a five star PA guy out on loan at Luta in the top flight 25 games for them this year as well this is perfect for his development if he keeps playing games for Luta over the next few seasons either he becomes a goat for them and really helps them boost themselves up and get into Europe or they develop a perfect winger for us which and he has 10 tackling could maybe retrain him as a wing back for us later down the line don't really know either way for £35,000 yes please now to the two biggest outlays of the window. First up is Sasha Rajelovic, a Serbian centre-back. Four million pounds we dropped on him. And the reason is simple. It wouldn't be one of my saves. For those of you that watch my content for a long period of time, it would not be one of my saves if I didn't have a giant Serbian centre-back in my backline. It's just the rules. I don't make them. I simply follow them. And he is the epitome of that. You cannot teach six foot five. Six five, 17 jumping reach, 16 pace, which has only just actually occurred to me that he's extremely quick. A bit slow off the mark, but then, you know, he's very large. It takes a while, but once he gets going, he's like a Bugatti Veyron. Although those accelerate very fast. That's a terrible analogy. But anyway, technically he's decent mentally he's okay although the aggression is a little bit low we just think that from a physical standpoint he's excellent 32 appearances three goals as well which has been fantastic and i think um they, i don't think any of them have been headers either he just ticks a lot of boxes of what we wanted now obviously because we were spending four million he simply could not be worth that here which is just hilarious in a way but there you go i really like him i still think that it's interesting that his determination is going up too he's developing nicely it's a lot of money but we could afford it and that brings us to our biggest signing yet. And this is he. Now, ignoring the three stars for a second, this is Cesar Vega. 4.6 million from River Plate. Unflappable personality, so there's decent professionalism in there. I like him. Six goals, 10 assists this season. He's got great passing, good on both feet. Actually got a bit of height about him too. And I do like having a tall team, especially in my centre midfielders, because I often notice that losing those aerial battles when teams take long goal kicks, particularly when they drop quite short, can be devastating and getting the ability to actually win those headers there is quite useful now he only has six heading and his jumping reach is 14 though so we'll at least manage to win the header a lot of the time and i just think he's a solid player now it is a lot of money for us to spend but i've been really happy with him he just seems to despite maybe not having as many assists this season as goreyev there's something about the way that the team plays with him in it that just seems to look way way better and i think he's just improved us in general but it's still a lot of money and you can see again his value is not going to quite reach that but that's just how it goes with us at the moment does like big matches as well i think he's just got a lot of good pros as well other than the injury proneness but to be fair thus far i don't think he's actually had a single injury this season cue a broken ankle next year and i think the reason we obviously had to pay through the nose as well was because we were looking for a few guys that would actually be first teamers immediately and that's tough at our level because guys that we've got some such a good squad in places that players that would improve us are too expensive or simply play for clubs already that they will not have any interest in joining a maltese team so most of the time we have to bring in young players and then develop them into those guys so it's always difficult doing this bit of shopping and you generally have to spend a little bit more. So what we've kind of done this year is balance it out with a few sort of first team choices like him and Rajelkovic and obviously Staver, but he's more of a loney. And then balance that out with some of those free guys that you show, I showed you earlier that have really low like transfer fees, but look to have the potential to maybe become these kind of guys later. Another cheeky little pickup for us actually was Jose Miguel Juarez uh, from Atletico Bucaramanga on a free transfer. I mean, there's really nothing to say about this because Bern Vizhnevsky has fallen down the pecking order. I feel like he may well leave in this summer. And now we have the perfect backup for our main man richard guicune uh 
he's ready to go, basically. And for free, can't really say no. One last player to show you. And that's, this is he. This is David Rojas, who has come in on a free transfer from Junior FC, technically, although it wasn't a direct free transfer. So the situation with him was that he was actually released from his club. I believe it was not even in the last season. I think it was like in 2032. Like, I don't remember the exact situation either. It was that he was completely released and we couldn't sign him because he was too expensive and he wanted like £14,000 a week. And then eventually just from whittling him down over time. He still didn't find a club. I put another bid in and we got him on 4.2k a week. And I think he's just a really, really solid centre back. He's just so well-rounded. Um, six foot two, solid on both feet, 15 jumping reach. He's got 15 pace, 15 acceleration. It's nice to have a bit of speed in our back line. You know, 12, 14, 13, it's okay. It's not elite by any means, but right now we can't afford elite and just having more depth here. And you'll notice we've signed a lot of centre backs lately. Some of them will probably leave once we kind of narrow it down to who we really want. But I feel like David Rojas is going to be the kind of guy that can do that. Uh, play 13 games for us over the course of the second half of the season as he only joined us in January I believe it was late January I think it was when he hopped aboard the train but again I really really like him and that's all completes our transfers for this window but I think we've done well but it's just really tough to strengthen it's going to be a case of players you start seeing in the future are more likely going to be guys I signed two or three years ago that we've developed into being first teamers it's so tough at this stage to sign first teamers because we don't have the rep or the budget really to do that just yet even though we do have a lot of money so before I talk you through what's happened briefly in the league this year I mentioned earlier that we would worked on a different tactical approach mostly for the memes because chat and I in a fit of giddiness decided that we wanted to see if we could take full advantage of the new sort of positional play systems that we've kind of been using a little bit in our current tactic that's in FM24 but to like the nth degree and I'll show you what I mean. This here is the house that memes built. So you know I love a Trecotista. Last year we actually had a tactic with eight of them, as you know. And basically, we use a halfback and a libero in our normal tactic. They swap over, it creates some kind of fun. So we decided to see what would happen if we put three halfbacks in front of three liberos for the memes, obviously. And then chat decided that we needed four Trecotistas, so we ended up with this monstrosity. But the best part about this is, because of the way that the halfbacks and liberos swap over, it means that every time we're in possession, they charge up the pitch into the midfield and the halfbacks drop deeper. But it means that when you're out of possession, you get this like two banks of three that are so deep that it's almost impossible to get through. Despite there being loads of gaps on the wing, the way this tactic is designed, in theory anyway, is to actually funnel them into this central area where it's just like this kill box and we just win the ball off them every single time. You just end up with players popping up in weird places and you might be sitting there thinking, Matt, you're talking about this as if this is a serious tactic and not just some kind of meme. And hear me out right? I'll show you in a minute because it's actually worked for us. Now, I'm not saying I'd take this into a Champions League game against PSG because we're not on that level even if we were playing on a normal tactic, but it does seem to have its merits. As you can probably guess, we won the league. 72 points, uh, 12 clear of Hamroon in the end, but you can see despite the fact that Hamroon are, you know, they're not on our level, obviously, they're still regularly better than everyone else, which is all we kind of need from them. But the plus 48 goal difference should still show you just how much better they are than most of the other teams in the league. They actually beat us away from home. Um, so they beat us at home, essentially, uh, this season as well to show you the level that they're on. They are improving in many ways, particularly with Joaquin Salvucci. This guy has been an absolute monster for hammering this season across all competitions. I think he has over 30 goals for them. Goodyear are kind of establishing themselves pretty much as the third team in Malta now, which is fine. We want that kind of hegemony. It's just that fourth team that's sort of always up for grabs. This year, Birki Kara become that team team and I believe that part of that is down to the goals of Vladimir Stava um, because we did decide to throw them a few players and it's really worked for them but much like last year you can see the sort of a top six that kind of break away mostly due to the goal difference here just ignoring Hibernians with their plus four despite only having 35 points unfortunately both promoted sides went back down Marsa and Slima and Marsa were actually out of the relegation zone for a lot of the season but just dropped in right at the very end because they couldn't stop conceding goals one final thing to show you is that Hamrun only conceded 15 goals this season they had a better defensive record than we did um, and that's despite playing against us twice and they also kept a clean sheet against us, I believe. But just to walk you through a little bit related to that tactic, we normally win games relatively okay. Generally speaking, we've won 24 out of, t you know, it it's okay. But the wins aren't usually by massive numbers all the time. It's usually fairly tight and obviously the league's getting better. I decided to switch over and play that silly tactic for the final three league games of the season. Uh, we put eight past Marsa, we put six past Valletta away from home, and then put six past Luta on the final 20 goals in three games with that our goal difference was nowhere near what it was until we started playing that tactic i also played it in the cup final against hamroon who are very good and we beat them 4-0 more testing required but it is just a bit fun to be able to mess around with stuff like that more updates on that later in the second tier balsan youth absolutely walked it as a return to the top flight immediately for them and xira are actually back in the top flight it seems that that win over sirens in real life last year has buoyed them into success and they're going to be joining them next year in the top flight daniel guthjonsson with 30 goals for balsan this year that's a hell of a record so now to us and Europe and I was a silly so I made the save file so we could see the early data cache stuff and then I forgot that I had the auto save set up and it saved over it so unfortunately that 
is once again in this position. I'm so sorry about that. Um, I've actually set a note in the game now every single year that will remind me to set a save file for that and also to make it a separate one that doesn't then just get overridden. So this should, in theory, I know we said that before, be the last time this happens. Now, in a weird twist, we actually ended up with the exact same draw in the first round of the Champions League qualifiers as we did last year against Pida Linamiskond of Estonia. And it went much the same with a 6-0 victory followed by a 9-1 win. Although the 9-1 win did feature this rather bizarre goal. Now he seems to have been reassessed and... I want to see where this is going, chat. Let him cook. <laughs> Literally, what is bro doing? This is going to become a goal somehow. It feels like it. Oh my god, what a pass. Wait. <laughs> we score off of it. This then set up a tie against FCSB, which we were able to go through fairly easily. 5-2 on aggregate with a 4-2 and a 1-0. Next up was Maccabi Tel Aviv, a fairly easy 3-2 victory, followed by a 4-1 pushed us through to the final round where we would play Shakhtar Donetsk, which we made light work of with a 4-0 victory away from home, followed by a 2-0 victory at home to progress to the group stages for the third season in a row. And we were blessed with some fairly winnable fixtures, which meant we felt that at the very least we had to be getting top 24, and maybe, just like last season, a top 16 spot was on the cards yet again. And we started off very well with a 5-3 victory at home against Fenerbahce. And this is important because we played them exactly in this same fixture last year in the Champions League and only took a 2 all draw. So the progress is clearly happening. And it got even better as a Henry Watara masterclass gave us a 4-2 victory over Olympiacos to make it two wins out of two and six points on the board straight away is very, very good news. And then we welcome Liverpool. Um, always going to be tough. And finally, the data's back. And what a game for the data to come back for. Sirens 5, Liverpool 2. Now, obviously, looking at the statistics, we were very fortunate to win this game. Um, we did do, however, for me, very, very well. I think Liverpool's penalty was nonsense. And, I mean, you can see that. They, they were 5-1 down to us at one point in this game. It was insane. Five different goal scorers for us as well. We really have got this record of just rolling teams at home. Uh, Although we did get that great win away from home as well. You can see as well, Vida with a goal and two assists in this match. This is the kind of performances out of him that we've always wanted. But also, this game also featured one of our wonderful little short free kick routines that I told you guys about last year. They're finally starting to come into bloom. He, hang on, he can play the short. He's going to play the short. Oh, mate. Oh, mate. Oh, my God. It's 4-1. Sirens 4. That is the exact free kick that we tried to choreograph. This isn't like the game doing it. That's when we programmed. That is a custom set piece setup. I can't believe that actually worked. So suddenly, we were three wins out of three, nine points on the board, and for my money, that's already top 24 secured after just three games, which is just as well because we played like absolute crap away at a really strong Benfica side who have like Arda Goulet, players like that. We offered nothing here and thoroughly deserved a 3-0 defeat. And then frankly, the quality of performance didn't really pick up away at probably our easiest game of the entire time, Slavia Prague. We did get the win through, uh, through Melman and Inter's Lignon, but... Like, looking at the stats, we were very fortunate to get this result. We did not play well at all in this game, which then followed possibly the most boring match I've ever seen on FM. I think there was one highlight, and it was a free kick that just glazed over the crossbar. There was nothing going on, but we'll take the 0-0 draw against Leverkusen. It was more points on the board, and they are truly awful, just like we are at this point, apparently. Then it was PSG, and, well, I mean, PSG things happened. What I will say, though, is we did take a 2-0 lead in the Parc de France. After 10 minutes, we scored our first two shots of the game, and we were in dreamland. And then the inevitable happened and Paris Saint-Germain, much like the last time we took the lead against PSG, put five goals past us. I mean, look at this team. What were we supposed to do about this team? But then on the final day of the group stage, we pulled off this result. Sirens 4, Porto 1. Now, Porto in this save are nowhere near on the level of Benfica and it kind of shows here. But for Fana again, who's had a breakout year, Vega and Melman with the goals. It's just a dream. Now, again, Porto could have definitely done more in this game. They had some big chances, which they missed. And I think there was one really good chance that was offside, but the game just counted it as the XG anyway, for some reason, as it does that sometimes. But a massive win gave us 16 points in the group stage. Now, usually 17 is what you need to get top eight. So the question is, did we? Of course we bloody did. Eighth place. Sirens, eighth place. Plus five goal difference is not a lot, I must admit, but we scored 22 times this year. The goal scoring was much better. We also conceded twice as many as last year, but that's a different story. We got into the top eight. The first time ever in this save, we managed to qualify for the top eight. Most years, we wouldn't quite, this wouldn't quite be enough points, but it is what it is. We're above Liverpool, Arsenal, Inter, Bayern, but they're weird in this save. Man United as well. It's just an incredible season for us. And just to get those extra points and just think how many coefficient points that is for us as well. Fantastic. So that naturally gave us a bye into the round of 16 of the Champions League. And our opponents for that would be Inter. 
not easy as particularly we could have actually got Red Bull Salzburg in that round and that would have been amazing and then the first leg was an absolute disaster uh Latoro Martinez with a hat trick in this game it was frustrating as all hell because the first one was one of these ones where it's a shot that hits the crossbar the keeper instead of catching it I think it was the keeper or the header they just head it straight to the forward who's right there to put it in instead of doing literally anything else we then gave away or actually it was before that gave away a dumb penalty and then I think it was a corner goal it's unfortunate but it is what it is just one of those games we weren't very good but at least in the second leg we pulled it back a little bit we got the win it wasn't enough to actually progress us but it's still good for coefficient points if we're going to go down we're going to go down swinging and at least take some points with us along the way so it's the best ever achievement for us in the champions league in the sense that we haven't actually progressed through a round of the knockouts yet but we got a buy this year so we actually ended up a further round in anyway so to get to the final 16 of the champions league is really good progress we do need to just kind of get that cutting edge though for those really tough games in the round of 16 i just don't think our squad is quite there yet but i feel like i can regularly see us qualifying at least pretty much for the knockouts i would say every single year for the rest of the save but it's a question of how we take ourselves to the next level and that's just going to come from developing the players we have and trying to strengthen where we can so that's great lots of points for us lots of points for malta but did we get any help from the other Maltese sides this year and that's where the juicy bit comes in first up were goodyear in the conference league second qualifying round and they made relatively light work of anathorsis famagusta as well to progress through but i think it was five goals to two unfortunately their journey came to an end not long afterwards in austria against lask uh, a 4-1 defeat in the first leg was a bit harsh on them when you look at the statistics but they did get the home win against them which again i think really does show the progression if they had a slightly more winnable tie next up it was hibernians and they wow i mean look at this they pulled off one of the results of the save they having lost at home against sparta prague which we expected them to do they then went to czechia and won five goals to two to progress through seven five on aggregate and that is some result which set them up with a tie against the Lezhnichar of bosnia and we thought brilliant then they won the first leg three one and then absolutely bottled it in Bosnia. To lose that game 3-0 was shocking because that would have been a perfect opportunity for them to progress through to the playoff round. Easy times, they bottled it, frankly. So it kind of, what they give us, they also take it away. But it's still progress, which just left Hanrun in the Europa League qualifier. So at least they'd have a chance to drop down potentially. But remarkably, they didn't need to do so straight away as they got a 4-3 victory against Radnik Sodalica, followed up with a win against the mighty Ferenc Varos fairly easily to move to the third qualifying round of the Europa League. They have never been to that stage before in this save. I think it's just got better from there as they drew Spartak Trnava, one of the weaker sides they could have drawn at that round, and beat them 4-3 to move to the playoff round of the Europa League, which means that they were guaranteed group stage in some form. The question is, what? Yeah, it was obviously going to be the Conference League. They drew Rangers. Uh, they put up a fight, though, I would say. Like a 2-0 defeat across two legs where they actually got a draw against them in Malta, I think is a real sign of the progress that Hamrin are making. And truthfully, we were actually kind of glad. That was probably the best case scenario other than maybe them winning one leg and still going out because we would much prefer them at the moment to be in the Conference League. Hopefully more points for up for grabs for them. But this is where it gets better. Yeah, they only went and came 10th in the group stage. <laughs> Once they got there, they were all over it. We could not believe our eyes. Four wins out of six for Hamrun, 12 points in six games. They were literally only knocked out of getting top eight on goal difference, too shy of what Pauk got. And that shows you the levels that Hamrun are now on. If they can get in here, they can get points. I'll show you their wins. They got victories against Spartak Trnava, again, ironically. They also beat an Icelandic side away from home. 2-0 win against Mulder and a 3-0 over Motherwell, though, really does sort of show the quality levels that Hamrun are putting forward. And that also meant that they'd be guaranteed a tie in the next round against a team from the bottom half here and they would get the pleasure of playing Maribor of Slovenia and in that first leg they went to Slovenia and won by three goals to one and we could not believe our eyes they then completed the result with a 1-0 victory in the second leg as well to make it 4-1 on aggregate and two more wins for them now at this point it got a bit tougher as they would play Anderlecht in the next round and we thought okay you've done your job and we were kind of right they lost 1-0 at home to Anderlecht but if they're only losing 1-0 at home to top Belgian talent then it sort of shows you where we're at now especially as they then went to Belgium in the second leg and won and then went out on penalties they managed to go to Belgium though and win a game there and that for me is extremely exciting because they're only going to get better particularly as they've now got rep gain from that as well as the money that they would have gained for qualifying for it and also winning those matches up to this point that's really going to help them from a financial standpoint as well and I think this is where they really do start to take off I expect that we'll see Hamron in the conference league group stage I would say 80% of the time for the next five years, possibly. I'd like to think they could do it every year, but you just never know how the drop downs are going to work, right? So what did that do to the coefficients? <sighs> <laughs> yeah, it did this to the coefficients. Um, we got 13.5 points this season. That's insane. Last year, I was lauding the fact that we managed to get 8.3 when I wasn't expecting us to. And this year, we go and put five extra points over the top of that. We literally added 10 points to our coefficient score in one season. On the year, we were the eighth best team in Europe. We actually got higher point scores than like Germany and team countries like that. Now, I'm not saying we're going to get 13 points every year, but I feel like we should now be looking at 10 plus at least every year. And when you look at the next few years to come off, like a four, a seven, a four again, 
there's every chance that we could be looking at the mid 50 points within a few seasons. And a good example of what that could achieve is what Denmark have been up to. When you look at the sort of points they've been putting down over the last few years, they have pulled themselves all the way up, I believe, to seventh in the coefficient for next season as a result of that. And I truly believe that if we play our cards right, continue to the development, I would say within five years, we've got to be looking at top eight, if not top seven as well, and really starting to make inroads in there too and getting the other teams in there. But the most important thing is we've now moved up to 19th on the year. It does technically in a year and a half get us an extra round of qualification for us. But the real one we want is 15th spot because that's when we get that second Champions League place and basically guarantee Hammer into the group stages of something. Point being, things are really motoring now. We've done the hard work, the graft, the bit that is sometimes a bit tedious. And I realize that even from a viewer standpoint, but now we're at the point when everything just explodes and the fun can begin it takes a lot longer with malta because there's all the setup but hot damn am i i'm never i've never been more excited about this save than i am at this exact moment and naturally a good way of dashing that excitement would be to tell you that the youth intake was crap like literally probably the worst one we've had so far although it's actually not it's just that obviously we're better but still no usable players in it sadly and looking at team stats for the season well it's been a breakout year for seku fafana to be honest he and henry watara have kind of alternated around the squad in various games and you can see watara with 36 goals really good season for him but fafana with 35 goals has been hideously excellent particularly when you look at how much he's overperformed his xg he really is just a poacher man that gets in the right places melman with less goals this year 24 goals but also it's worth pointing out uh, man has got 24 assists I've never seen that from a striker. 24 goals and 24 assists for Ayore Melman. 48 goal contributions, actually worse than last year, but his roundedness of his play is insane. That front three have combined for, God, how many goals is that? It's, I think, 90 goals plus between the three of them over the course of the year is just insane. And when you look at the assists as well, Vida has 17, 14 of which were in the Champions League, which is a brand new record. Palacio as well with uh, 13 goals. Also got, sorry, not 13 goals, eight goals as well for him and 13 assists. Although that is because Palacio has operated as a trek in that on the left side of that weird system at the end of the season and was banging them in. Um, Fafana as well with 12 assists, Camera and Lem with 12, and Doi with 12, Cesar Vega with 10, Jar Jar with 10, Watara with 9. It's just, there's goals all over this team right now, and I'm very excited to see what happens next year as we keep strengthening and maybe playing a bit more of that funny tactic in the league just to see how many goals we could maybe score with it. Because I realise the teams we're playing against are obviously a lot weaker, but even against our old tactic, we weren't able to do that. So there is clearly something there, but we would get ripped apart by a PSG. And fun tactics are fun. That's part of the game. It's supposed to be fun, right? To turn it back sort of seriously for a second, if I could, generally speaking, the way the team has lined up is emphatically not like this. It's been Fafana or Watara on the left-hand side with Nelman in here. Then generally speaking, Vega and Kamga and Lend in the middle with Tony Sunday in behind. Uh, Vida Zinia or Endoy at right back and then either Palacio or Jar Jar with sometimes a bit of salt and of mayhem in there too. The back line has been very fluid, although Rojas, Rajelovic and um, Tunkara have kind of been the back three a lot of the time but plenty of other options have also stepped in this year. With most games being played by Richard Gwikune, uh, obviously Bern Vizhnevsky still played 17 times, but not as often as a big man Richard. As for this, there's really no set starting lineup for this. I just play whoever fits. Right, to the loan farm. And the first thing you'll note is that it's actually gone down. So we are down to 98 players on loan, and there's, there's two reasons for this. The first is that we've decided to focus a bit more on quality now. Now that we've got a decent number of players out on loan, we're starting to focus on getting guys like this, more of the loan, so obviously Al Kamaji. There's a few guys that we tried to get out at the end of um, January, but all the deals fell through during the party exchange which is very annoying i'm hoping in the summer particularly as some of those teams are now going to be in europe it will hopefully help us push that over the line and get those loan moves done because i would like a few more of those guys out alone if we can do because they're just simply not going to get in our team but you can see there's still a lot of players that have this sort of level of potential and bear in mind a one and a half star ca player is a good player for most premier league sites to give you an idea of where those kind of guys are at so if they could develop into even this sort of level player then they're going to be absolutely insane people like armando perez that's two and a half stars he's a star player in this league he's actually been the top scorer of all of the loanies to contribute to 37 goals is insane. Panazio for Goodyear as well, with 18 is not too bad as well. Just generally good stuff going on across the board. The loan farm is being strengthened. The other reason that it dropped off slightly was because for some reason, there was a random batch of like 10 loans. They had no connection to each other. that all just expired in April for some reason. And I do not know why. And because it was outside of a transfer window or whatever, I wasn't able to extend them, even though they had loads of time left on their contract. So most of them weren't players that are actually that important to keep out on loan. They were mostly like, Sort of fodder if you like but it's still annoying so hopefully we'll get this number back up again and get some of the loans for these type of guys uh, over the course of the summer if we can do that especially as the latest winter update is allegedly supposed to have changed some stuff to do with loans to allow you to get some more but if anything for me it seems to have made it worse we'll see so i don't know what your experiences have been like with the winter update with regards to loans but for me it seems to have made it harder to get loans out as for the finances we well bloody hell Oh, of course, yeah, we've got the Champions League money right at the very end there for the consolidation money or whatever it's called. We have £50 million in the bank. 
So even with the lower values, we are chilling right now. 32 million pound transfer budget. We could spend another 20 million this year and be comfortable in the knowledge that we'll probably make 40 million back just from Champions League, in theory. Wage budget's absolutely wild. <laughs> How much are we spending right now? Yeah, our wage budget is nearly double our spending. So plenty of money is available for us. Pretty much all of our income is just Champions League money at this point. Yes, we're getting money from gate receipts and season tickets and a bit of TV revenue, but we're only getting like... I don't know. I mean, TV revenue, that was Champions League TV revenue anyway. We're maybe getting like a million a season in champion, in TV revenue. It's really not a big deal, but it's good for the other multi sides. And that's the crucial part. And our aims for season 11 is pretty much to just repeat this year if we can do. Try to get to the knockouts of the Champions League. That should be relatively straightforward. I'd love to win a round, but it does require, just depend on the tie that you get. And just hope that, hopefully, in theory, Hamrun end up in the Conference League group stage again. And maybe with a bit of luck, take someone like Goodyear or Birkikara with them. If we got two in there... Honestly, if we got two teams in there at this stage, we could absolutely pop off and actually maybe even be challenging for like one of those extra coefficient spots just because we're so low down and there's so little dilution. If we were to go on a run like that before we start getting more teams in Europe, it could really make some insane seasons that could actually maybe hinder us later down the line. But it's just kind of fun when you're doing it from this far back. So that is what we'll be doing over on stream right now. If you have enjoyed this video, drop a like. That would be fabulous. If you're new to the channel, subscribe. That would be glorious as well. The Patreon region recap will be out uh, hopefully very soon for you guys over on there as well. And I'll see you guys in lots of videos coming up in the coming weeks. Hold your gun, Capybara. Bye-bye.